26th day of November 2018, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar. This indeed is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard in a variety of other places. We do welcome you to this show on a moon day, which is going to start an interesting broadcast week, I promise. Uh, on Tuesday... Tonight, by the way, well, let's let's begin with tonight. How about that? Tonight, Jordan Maxwell's running just a touch late, but uh, he should be on with me very shortly, and we're going to continue the series and the discussion that we've been having for many weeks. On Tuesday, um, we will have J.P. Satilli with us, and also regular Joe has agreed to join us in the first hour well, where Mike Swanson would normally be because Mike will be away and unable to join us. On uh, Wednesday... Looks like we're going to have Joseph Flatley about his new book, and that one ought to be a most interesting <laughs> um, kind of uh, uh, mental uh, yoga test there. I don't know, contortion of the mind, I think, might go on just a little bit with that discussion with Joseph Flatley. On Thursday, I may have an unpleasant conversation with Jefferson Morley, and Friday is beginning to look a lot more interesting than I thought it would, but has not been solidified just yet. So uh, that's the way the week rolls out so far, and we have a couple of other irons in the fire, so to speak. So um, apparently I've got a little bit of a technical issue with grabbing Jordan, so I'm going to do my best to get a hold of him before we get into the subject matter tonight. I want you guys to, uh, while I'm doing this, I want you guys to uh, uh, remember that we are taking questions. Jordan appreciates them. So if you'd like, you can go to the live chat room at Ocelli.com. You can also email it to me, info at Ocelli.com. You could, uh, let's see, what else should I do? I'll keep the email open. I'll go to Twitter, I guess, if you want a private message, a question to Jordan there. Or if you're on my Skype list and you wish to send me a text message on there regarding the subject matter for tonight. Now, we are going to start off with religion. It does seem as though... Uh, Jordan might want to expand a little bit on that particular topic tonight uh, in some ways that uh, he normally doesn't. But, you know, it seems like every week holds that sort of promise. So, again, continuing exactly the thing that we need to continue. Tell you what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to take a short break and see if I can't get Jordan on the phone elsewhere, which you guys won't be able to hear, um, and, and see what we can do about getting him right on and into the discussion. Because, um, hmm... Little, little strange at the moment. Uh, normally he's right there ready and waiting. So anyway, uh, what we'll do in the meantime is play a little song from Cirrus Minor. It's called Waiting Dilation. Here at Ocelli.com and I'll be right back with all hope in mind the Jordan Maxwell. So I just spoke to Jordan off air really quickly. He, he is running late, yes, but uh, will be joining us very shortly. Now I have a couple of questions from you guys already loaded up and ready to go. We shall uh, soon see what else we uh, wind up discussing. I never can tell exactly what direction Jordan is going to go in, but uh, he is just preparing, plugging in his mic and all that good stuff. So what we'll do, because I took a very long break there at the very onset of the show, is get straight into it with him in uh you know as soon as he calls in and we'll skip the normal break that we take at the one hour mark just just to be sure uh we, we might take a like maybe a two minute break instead of the normal five six seven that i do at that time but it'll be very very brief and uh we'll get straight on into everything uh as soon as jordan arrives meanwhile uh if you want to enter some of those questions you can if you're on my skype list do that I am also going to uh, open up, I think I said I'll open up Twitter, so I'll do that right now. I'll open up Twitter if you guys have, at Ocelli Effect at Twitter. You can uh, send me a question that way without an issue. Um, but Jordan, I did get a hold of him, and he will be with us shortly. So uh, so there there we go. If uh, if you guys you know want to drop a question there at Twitter, no problem. In the live chat room, no problem. On the Skype, no problem. And, uh, hey, even the email, info at Ocelli.com. Any question which is even remotely um, reasonable, <laughs> let's put it that way, uh, reasonable, um, I will get straight on to it. Now, I'm also going to do a little presentation uh, on my own regarding some of this material coming up in, 
I don't know if I'm going to make that an extra thing. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take a little bit of listener feedback and see where you guys want to go because, um, some of the odder questions that have come up because of the series with Jordan about religion also involve, um, also involve things like the, uh, the history of Samaria and stuff like that. And, um, this way, I can uh, do that presentation on my own at some point, and I'm not prepared to do it tonight. Otherwise, I might have just launched into it. But uh, I do actually have Jordan Maxwell with me now. And yep. if you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, you can follow up on all these subjects, especially if you go ahead and join the Research Society, which there's a button for it at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Uh, there's also videos which one can download and have right away on demand for a small fee over there so that you don't have to buy a DVD or anything like that. You're getting them straight from the man himself. When you go into the Research Society, though, there's a lot more material in there. There's uh, literally, I think, a couple of ebooks. There's uh, definitely videos. There's links to things. There's information, images, stuff that is not necessarily everywhere, and it's all grouped together about things like government, banking, religion, so on and so forth, and a lot of in-depth ways to get into it. But it all begins at the only website, which is Jordan Maxwell's, actually. Actually, the man's website, jordanmaxwellshow.com. And that's the only website that's his, just so you know. Anything that's, you know, connected or recommended there, that's his business. That's what he chose. <laughs> you, you find his name in a lot of places, but not necessarily being presented to it you know, being presented to you by him, number one. Number two, you'll also find that uh, you can email Jordan there, and it actually gets to Jordan. And you can make donations and things like that. Uh, also at the website, all of those things are available there, plus a public section which has general information as well. But anyway, Jordan. <laughs> yes, sir. Great to have you along. We, well, thank uh, you. Thank we do you have for a, inviting me. Absolutely, and, and we're continuing on with this series. Now, we've got a couple of questions already loaded up. Uh, okay. I have invited people, of course, to drop more if they want in the chat room or on Skype, or they can send it to me via email right now while we're on the air. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you don't get it to us by the time we're on the air, I will absolutely save it for next time, which I have a few of those saved up already. But first of all, I'd like to find out how you're doing today. <laughs> uh, well, comparatively we're... well for uh, for a 78 year old, I'm doing okay. I think I, I I'm doing all right when it comes to my work and thinking, but not getting around too well. I'm getting to where I'm kind of uh, being stuck at home and stuck in one room because I don't get out too much. But you know, and I'm not able to do a whole lot anymore like I used to. I was always running. All my life I've been running and trying to get done with the things I feel I need to do. But today I just don't have the uh, the, the old stuff to, you know, the old stamina to do the things I want to do. And that's really disgusting to me because there's so many places I'd like to go and talk to people and and do seminars and so many things I want to say and need to say and people need to hear. <coughs> Excuse me. And and I, so I, I guess the best way to handle what I need to do is do it by radio because at least this way people can re, it can be recorded and heard later. Because I got so many things I want to tell people that they don't know. And it's fascinating subject about how much the world is ill-informed on. Well, th this, uh, is all, this is all part of the... Oops, wait a second there. There we go. <laughs> this is no. all uh, uh, part of the discussion uh, that, that needs to be had, sure. And I love listening to you on anything that you're uh, you're talking uh, on, you know, when it, whether it's a video or it's, a, you know, clips that people use from your videos or whatever. I love encountering your... Uh, very concise way of, of giving presentations. Another thing, by the way, if somebody's listening to this right now and you feel as though you'd like to have Jordan come to you and talk to you or give a presentation at a conference or something like that, if you wanted to do that, um, actually, now, now the thing is, <laughs> neither Jordan nor myself have the money necessarily to send Jordan somewhere. 
But on occasion, you would be willing to work something out where if uh, if they're willing to pay your expenses to go to a conference and give a presentation about this topic or others, uh, all they would have to do really is email you over at jordanmaxwellshow.com and see if they could work it out with you directly, right? Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, uh, but like I said, I don't get out very much anymore. I don't, I don't really travel very much anymore. I've traveled around the world. I've given lectures in Egypt and the Middle East and all over Europe. I've traveled extensively. Yeah. But, you know, at 78 years old, I just don't do well at traveling. And those 19 hour plane trips are, are, are very destructive now to me. But, uh, and right. I don't really get out very much anymore. But what I can do, is I do uh, individual uh, counseling, uh, r- telephone calls, consulting, and also with the new technology that the web has that I can uh, do seminars and it can be seen in different places in the world. I've done that. I've done seminars in France and Europe uh, from here, from my home. Because I, you know, the, the technology is there now, so mm. uh, I, I I don't go out very much anymore because I'm I'm too old and tired and and, and burned out, right, and right. it takes so much out of me to travel anymore. Well, I'm I'm thinking more like a short trip. I mean, if somebody wanted you to say go to Texas or California or yeah, you know, yeah, or somewhere yeah. like Seattle, or I'd, something I'd, like that. I would be interested to hear and see and talk with them. I would be interested to talk talk with them, and if it's something that we look like we could do, then I I wouldn't mind doing that because I really enjoy talking to audiences. I it's something I really have enjoyed all my life is being able to talk to people and wake mm-hmm. them up. And have the and see the the light on their face when they when they finally hear something that's true, and it makes sense. And then finally they begin to see what I'm talking about. It's very rewarding to educate people. It's a very rewarding career to be able to speak to people, and wake them up and tell them things that they've known all their life. They knew something was wrong, but you tell them and explain it to them. So right. that they can finally understand it correctly, what is going on on the earth today. And that's what I've been doing for years, and I love doing it. So well, that's why radio is best for me, oh, radio sure. and uh, and my videos. No, a- absolutely. And I, and I know you appreciate it when people email you, too, uh, to yep. let you know. Even, even, you know, again, you could just email stuff to Jordan and tell him, you know, look, I, I was listening to the show. I learned this or you know, or I have a question, or uh, you know, that, that's another thing you like to see is that you you cause somebody to think, you cause them to become uh, educated more, more yep. than they were before, uh, and uh, even even an email is something you appreciate. If you can't see them face to face, you you can also get get a hold of them that way. So yes, it's very rewarding to me when I get people emailing me because I, at my age, I live by myself. I have no family. I live on by myself and do all that I do by myself. And so it's very rewarding for, for you know, in my life now to have people contact me and, and, uh, you know, just so that I know they're out there and that they care and that I'm actually being able to, uh, affect other people and, and causing them to think and wake up and ask questions and all kinds of it's just very nice to, to to get emails from people who care about you and who care about what you're doing and to know that you're making some kind of uh, of any impact on people so if you have anything you want to talk with me about just email me email me mm-hmm. is the best way to contact me it's the only way really Right, because I, I I live on my computer twenty four seven. I live in and and continually monitor my emails because I get emails from all over the world, and a lot of them are very important. A lot of important people in the world will tell me things about the subjects that I deal with that I didn't know, and uh, and and I learn a lot from people. I learn a lot from listening to people who are experts in different subjects that I talk about, I know about, but I always say I'm not the world's foremost uh, expo. 
I'm not the foremost expert in the world on anything. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. Right. But I learn a lot from people. Lots of interesting people write me and tell me things that I had nowhere, no way of knowing. I've had professors at universities in England uh, write me and say they heard me talking about this or that, and let me explain to you what this and that means. And uh, and then I've got something now. Now I've got something really good that I can share with people. Right. Uh, for instance, a classic example is I'm I've been talking for years about the difference between. Jesus being God's son, S-O-N, or S-U-N. I say that Jesus is a symbol for the son, S-U-N, not S-O-N. And then I say, and I've been saying it for many years, that S-O-N and S-U-N are interchangeable. It's the same word. It just is interchangeable. So therefore, when you are told that Jesus is God's son, it's not his S-O-N. It says S-U-N. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, of course, the son is the light of the world. And we are told that Jesus is our risen Savior. Well, of course, the S-U-N, Son of God, is the risen Savior. Of course, it's our risen Savior. If it doesn't rise in the morning, we're dead. Nothing's going to grow. We're going to freeze to death. Right. So it is your risen Savior. And so, uh, and then I got an email from a professor in uni- at a university in England an English professor who said, incidentally, Jordan, you're talking about the difference between S-O-N and S-U-N. Yes, in English, there's a problem called the lazy O. Lazy O. Mm. And the idea in English of this uh, concept of the lazy O is that... uh, when the when the translators were translating all the other languages into English, and they were translating other documents, etc., from around the world into the King's English, many many years ago, uh, you know, during the Middle Ages, they came across a word S O N and S U N, and they called it the lazy O because the the translators and the King James translators said that the same it's the same word it can be spelled s u n or s o n and it and and it didn't mean two different things back then it was just the way it was spelled hmm. and so today of course we have now meanings that we have now put onto words so that s u n means that that bright morning star that comes up and lights the world, as opposed to S-O-M, which is your boy, your your offspring, your male offspring. Right. Why do we call him your son? Because he is the light of your life. And so the light that lights up your life is a, is your son. And so he said, but that in actual point of fact, in English, there is a, the proposition in English that S-U-N and S-O-N is the same identical word in English. It's called the lazy O. Look it up in the English uh, language, and it explains why the translators use the same word and spell it two different ways. It can be spelled either way all the time. In any in any situation, you can spell it S O N or S U N, and so I've been told people uh, Christians have said, "Well, Jordan is just mixing up words." No, that's the way the English professors in England will tell you. That's the way it was done. You right. could spell "son" either way, and it meant the same thing, whatever. But we have put understandings on the on the language today. That doesn't mean what it meant, you know, 500 years ago in the King's English. Well, that's a, that's so, the thing when you study etymology that you discover that a lot of things that uh, have contemporary meanings do not necessarily still mean the same thing that they meant 500, 600 uh, years ago. It, it, it is exactly apparently right. the same word, but I mean, even taking a, a look at a word completely unrelated to the subject, like nice. Mm-hmm. The word nice is not 
very nice. <laughs> you know, if you take a look <laughs> at the etymology, uh, it, it, you know, the, the old, the old phrase, right? Uh, common yep. phrase. He's a nice guy. Now, we, you and I know what we mean when we say that, Jordan, but if you take a look at the word nice, the way it originated and uh, came from another language, as most things do in the quote English end quote language, uh, it's kind of funny because originally it really meant somebody who's uh, not very bright and uh, easily manipulated. <laughs> and I imagine nice guys might not always be bright. I mean, if, if, if you're not so intelligent, the world is a lot easier to swallow as a nice place. Maybe you're happier if you're not intelligent enough to know how bad well, the world yeah, around because... you is. But it's an interesting thing that a nice guy is not really a nice guy the way we mean it. Uh, That's right. The so, word does not mean the same as what it was originally meant. Right. So it doesn't mean that uh, yeah. what we call nice today is not what it meant when that word first arrived on the scene. When we first used that word, it didn't mean what we mean today. Right. And, and I've got so a couple of questions what... from some people that uh, uh, today we would say they're they're probably nice people, but. I don't mean it in the etymology, you know, in the in the correct etymology, you know, the way it originated. Uh, I, I certainly don't mean it that way. But uh, some people have written in a couple of uh, odd questions, and mm -hmm. uh, I want to enter them into the discussion because they have been listening to the series. Uh, another talk show host uh, uh, that had me on as a guest even mentioned that uh, he really appreciated the series with you and thought it was uh, really, really solid the way that it's gone so far. Well, that's um, good. That's good. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, so uh, I know that a lot of people are listening, and uh, a few people have commented, and some have sent questions. So I'm going to start with the easiest one here. Um, and let's see. This is uh, this is from Joan, and she asks, uh, what does uh, Jordan think of the work of, Z okay, I always screw this up, but Zachariah Sitchin, I think yep. is his name. And uh, you know, it's pronunciation that, that bothers me there, but I, I think I did it right. Zachariah Sitchin and uh, and the work online of the group that calls themselves Spirit Science. Uh, is Jordan familiar with both, and what does he think of them in general in relation to the topic of religion? Okay. Yeah. That's the way the question well, is. Well, I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin. I wasn't just one of his friends and and was a you know and read his work, but I was actually a business partner with with Zachariah Sitchin. So I knew a lot about him, and he and I had many many conversations because we were business partners, and I would get him uh, to speak at certain lectures and get him to speak at conferences and. I helped him get some of his books published, and I got him to speak in different uh, uh, you know, seminars and different public lectures. So I was in business with Zachariah Sitchin, and he told me a lot of things, interesting things that uh, I don't I don't feel qualified to talk about in public. I don't think it's the, the right place to talk about some of the private conversations that he and I had. All I will say is that there was more to Zachariah Sitchin and his work and his story than meets the eye. He knew a lot more than he was telling us. Mm -hmm. And he was very interestingly connected behind the scenes to some very powerful people. And some really interesting stuff was going on with Zachariah Sitchin that people do not know. And I don't feel qualified to talk about in public. But, uh, but I'm just saying he... He was very, very knowledgeable, and and I wish I could, I wish I could tell you some of the conversations we had in private mm. that I you know that would not be uh, it would not be right to do, but uh, it would really uh, it would really excite your imagination if I told you some things about Zechariah that I know. Because he was very well connected behind the scenes throughout the world. There were a lot of very powerful people knew Zachariah Sitchin. They, they knew about his work and what he was doing. And I, and they, and I knew about them because I was in business with him. Uh, what was the other person's name, the other second? Uh, they asked uh, about Spirit Science, um, which I know is a YouTube channel, but I think also has a website. 
uh, and they've gone through the. Uh, are are no. you familiar with them? That, that that's the question. Really, no. Uh, no. What was the name again? Spirit Science. Spirit Simon. Science. It's a group of people. They call themselves Spirit Science. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Spirit Science. I've seen that. No, but I haven't really looked into their work. No, but I do remember seeing, coming across spirit science. I remember seeing that. Mm. But I have not looked into it myself, so I, I'm not really qualified to talk about it. No, nope, fair but, enough. But I, do yeah. know, but I do know about them. I'm a, I'll have to look at that. Now, I'm writing it down. I'm going to have to look at that when, when we're through with the show. Yeah, I think it sounds it's a, very interesting. Spirit science. Yeah, I mean, it, look, if you start on YouTube, they have a very interesting uh, a set of presentations. Um, they definitely, uh, you know, if you're looking at stuff that get, you know is related to Gaia TV, you'll find them related to them as well. Uh, it's interesting. It's yeah. it's very interesting. I I don't know. I'm if they didn't ask for my commentary, so uh, they asked you. But since yeah, uh, you well, know, I, hey, maybe you'll you'll look at it and you'll you'll discover. Uh, you need to look at it some more. I don't know, Jordan. It would be great to hear about it. But anyways. I'm, I'm always open because I'm always open to hear what people are into, people who are really dedicated their life to certain subjects. I want to know what they know. I want to hear what they have to say because I'm. that's the way I have come to educate myself as being in the company of really extraordinary people who have talked with me in private. And and I say to the public all the time, I'm not that clever. I'm not that smart. I, I What I bring to the table are the people that I have met in my life mm -hmm. and the subjects which they have opened me up to that I had no idea in the world that existed. And the Zachariah Sitchin is just one of many people that I got involved with. I wanted to promote him, and so I became a business partner. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a whole lot more going on in the world and a lot of interesting people out there that I have had the privilege of meeting and talking with and becoming close friends with. And this is why I talk about the things I do because these are the kind of people I like being around. I love hearing the, the scientists and philosophers and teachers and researchers, astronauts and politicians, all kinds of interesting people telling me all kinds of phenomenally interesting things about the world we live in, and that's why I do what I do, because I love being able to share with the world of mankind. I want to share with everyone what I have been learning over the years. Mm. So that's what I do, and so much, so much of it is so controversial. Why? Because most people have never heard real truth about much of anything. Right. So that's, that's what I do, and that's who I am, and that's why I try and stay on the cutting edge of what's happening around the world by talking to all the best of the best. And I've got so many dear friends that have let me in on their work, and, and I've had so many interesting experiences learning about things I didn't even know existed. Hmm. Well, so, you know, a, another question comes in, and, and this one uh, is is from somebody who was definitely listening to an earlier show. Uh, they they stated that they had caught it on YouTube, actually, and um, I don't think I saved his name here. I know it was a guy. I remember that. So I'm sorry uh, to you if you're listening. I didn't save your name in my notes here, but um, the question is pretty straightforward. Uh, I heard Jordan say that uh, he did not believe that uh, the Old Testament existed uh, early on or before the Christian version of the story. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. But but here's the question. Then what does he make of the Dead Sea Scrolls and many of the artifacts that have been discovered that seem to suggest that... Uh, the Jewish story is much older than most people believe and was a story that previously existed. Okay, that that's that's the whole question, Jordan. I'm, well, I'm just true. voicing it. So you know, Yes, but. but those stories did pre-exist. And I'm just saying that uh, according to the best minds today in Israel, the best philosophers, teachers, uh, researchers, authors, 
uh, especially professors in university and books coming out of Israel. There's a lot of academic uh, foundation for the idea that ancient Israel never existed. I do not believe that ancient Israel is a fact of history. I do not believe that there was a Jewish religion before the uh, A.D. I don't believe there was any such a thing as a as a uh, of an ancient Israel ever existed. I think it is a mere story that is not backed up by history and it has no basis in history whatsoever. Because I know for a fact that there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no King Solomon and King David. Mm -hmm. I I remember finding many years ago documents of research has been done on the ancient uh, Israeli religion, the ancient Israel. And it was saying there never was an ancient Israel. Israel today, we know, is not the ancient Israel of the ancient uh, in the in the Old Testament of the Bible. And what we call today the Old Testament in the Bible is actually the religion of the Phoenician Canaanites. There is no language. There there is no, in fact, Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is simply a particular dialect or a particular slant on the old Canaanite. Uh, religion, the old Canaanite Phoenician language. Because in uh, thousands of years ago, when the ancient Israel was supposed to have existed, there was no ancient Israel. There was Phoenicia Cana. And the Canaanites were in the area we call Israel today. They were called Canaanites, the land of Cana. And the Canaanite people spoke a particular language. It was called Phoenician. Phoenician language, and the Phoenician language was spoken in Cana, and today the Phoenician language is referred to as Hebrew. And so when you hear Jews talking, uh, and they will tell you, well, in the Hebrew language it says this, this, and that. I say there was no Hebrew. Mm. There is no Hebrew language. It's a Phoenician Canaanite. So talk to me about what the Phoenician Canaanite language says, because that's what you call uh, Hebrew. And so, if you understand that there was no Hebrew, uh, one professor in Israel said that connecting uh, the Islamic, uh, the Islamic, what we call the ancient Hebrew language with the Canaanite is like connecting uh, the Ang- English-speaking America with with London and with England, it's the same language but just a little different. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are, the Americans speak the language a little different than it's, than it's spoken in England, but it's the same English language. And so the people are we call today Hebrews. They speak a language which is the same as the ancient language, but that same ancient language is not Hebrew as Phoenician Canaanite. Well, and another, so another original, way to look at that would be also with Spanish, because there's proper Castilian Spanish, and then there are forms of Spanish that are spoken in many countries that differ from Spain's precisely. Spanish. So That's I mean, exactly it's just what I'm saying. Right. Another example. I'm just giving another example in case somebody says, yeah, "Well, yeah. you know, English is kind of the same anyway." A lot of Americans don't realize it. It is a bit different. Uh, yeah. Even some words are spelled differently. But uh, but Spanish is another good example of this, where you have uh, uh, various countries in South America. A lot of them speak Portuguese, but you know, or a form of Portuguese, I should say, which is again different from Spanish, but. Uh, but two Spanish speakers, you know, one from Spain and say one from Mexico, easy example there, um, they speak differently. They might be able to understand one another, and there are a lot of common links to the languages, certainly, and a lot of people describe it as the same thing, but it really isn't. There are differences. It's sort of like that, right? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's the difference between the Hebrew language and the Phoenician language. Canaanite, Phoenician language. Mm-hmm. The Phoenician language is the mother tongue, and Hebrew is just another way uh, uh, other other groups have used that language. 
So in the analogy, uh, England would be the Phoenician, you know, English itself, England, England's English would be the Phoenician tongue. Uh, and Spain, Spanish, uh, Spain, uh, excuse me, let me try this again. Spanish language from Spain would be the mother tongue and the Mexican language would end up being like the Hebrew language. The American language would be like the Hebrew language versus the original. So it's like that. It's, it's very, very similar. But slightly right. different. Okay. But slightly different Perfect. because of the people. And so, therefore, we say today in America, we say that we speak the American language. We speak America. No, you don't speak American. You are American. You speak a mother tongue, which is English. Mm-hmm. And so when we say that, they're, well, these, these people are speaking Hebrew. No, they are Hebrew. But they're speaking a Phoenician language. Right. They are Hebrew. And so we don't know the difference. So we just say, oh, well, they're Hebrews, so they're speaking Hebrew. No, they're Hebrews, but they're speaking Phoenician. It's a Phoenician ancient Canaanite language. So when you hear the idea of an ancient place called the land of Cana, that's the Hebrews today are from the land of Cana. They were actually Canaanites. And so when you read in the scriptures about the Canaanites, well, that's who today is in charge of Israel, the Canaanites. Right. They're, not, they're not a mystical people called the Hebrews. There was no King David. There was no King Solomon. I am telling you, there was no king. There was the, all of those words and all those famous people in the Old Testament never existed. And we say, well, you know, if you go back to one of the earliest Bibles, I came across one in an old bookstore once, an old Bible, and it, and everywhere where the Bible talks about King David, it said King Druid, D-R-U-I-D, not D-A-V-I-D. And in, in India, they have a Druid religion. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no problem, it's Jordan. You know, and, and the the thing about this is that again, with the languages changing over time, th- th- this is a a a a function of time, honestly, and and also of development. Because, for instance, there was no reason, say, for you know the the original English language to have a word for I don't know, pick something, computer, uh, initially, right? And so the language might develop and they might have slightly different names in England for a computer than we do here. And therefore the split, you know, begins to happen. Right. And there's also things that are only indigenous, say, to this part of the world that maybe they don't even have in the UK. Uh, So therefore we have to develop words or adopt an existing word from some other language in order to take it in. Doesn't even necessarily mean that the uh, English English uses it. Uh, That's right. You know, and, and the same thing happened with the Spanish and I imagine with the uh, with the Hebrew and, uh, uh, you know, Phoenician, because here's the interesting thing. Um, some people talk about there's ancient Hebrew and then there's more modern Hebrew. Right. Languages yeah. over time change. They must as a matter of function. Uh, that you, you have to develop new words for new things. Uh, if somebody invents a wholly new object, you gotta call it by something. If there That's is a right. new process that did not exist before, uh, you may have to describe it as something and sometimes they reach into the past and adopt an old world word from the past to mean something new or they, uh, uh create a new word. <laughs> you know, That's very right. simple, right? Yeah, so, it's very yeah. simple. And also, there is a hidden connection between the Hebrew people, the Jewish, what we call Jewish, and German. There is a very definite connection behind the scenes that has never been talked about in public. There is a definite connection between being Jewish and German. Mm. Germany or the German people are connected to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are connected to the German philosophies. The German religion is Jewish. The Jewish religion is German. It's a very difficult subject, and I haven't got to the bottom of it yet, but I do know that much that there is a definite connection between being Jewish and German. 
Oh, yeah. You, you've certainly <laughs> talked about it on here uh, quite a bit in the <clears throat> symbols, even uh, the most infamous symbol of the Third Reich. Uh, you've discussed that and exactly how it is on the very floors. You can look to the earlier episodes. It's on the floors of synagogues, that thing uh, which is called a swastika. Well, right. that that is on the floor of synagogues, interestingly That's right. The enough. swastika was not German. It was Jewish. Mm-hmm. The Jews used the swastika, and the Germans picked it up from the, from the Jews. And the Jews got it because they were following the ancient religions of Phoenicia Cana, which goes back to India. And this is why in India, the Hindus and Buddhists both use the swastika and the, and the uh, Star of David. Right. The Star of David is, has nothing to do with their, uh, King David because there was no King David. So the Star of David actually is referred to, if you look it up in the dictionary, as a hexagram. H E X hex hex is Latin for six, <clears throat> and interesting in Latin six is S E X is six in Latin. Right, it and, sure and is. So today we have something called a hex H E X, which is a six-pointed star. It's called the Star of Saturn. That's what these H the the, the Star of David represents as the planet Saturn. <clears throat> right. and, so there are other questions here yeah. as well, and and you've gone into this. Uh, and, and geometric shapes are a subject we could easily do a full two hour uh, discussion about just the geometry, if you will, <laughs> of yeah. the symbols, right? And the fact right. that uh, no, nothing is accidental. There are numbers to sides and points of things uh, that are completely intentional. Um, we've even talked about the uh, the five pointed star on here with you a little bit, and the six pointed star as well. I find it fascinating that uh, in England here here's another interesting difference between England and uh, America, which uh, which which I just note and I'm not sure what to make of. But you know their law enforcement badges over here we have five pointed law enforcement uh, stars, right? Yeah, you know for course. sheriffs and things mm-hmm. like that. But in England, not so all the time. Uh, they seem to use six-pointed uh, stars. <laughs> and, yeah, because the yeah. six-pointed star is the star of Saturn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Saturn is the Lord of the Rings. And that's why Jews are still making movies in Hollywood, Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings was the planet Saturn. Saturn was the Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> and today, the Jewish religion... <clears throat> Today, the Jewish religion is worshiping the planet Saturn. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always that way. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We are told that Judaism was the first monotheistic uh, religion in the world. The Jews were the first monotheistic people. The monotheistic, theistic, is is God. Theistic is something to do with God. Mm -hmm. Mono is one. So therefore, one God or anything dealing with the, uh, the, the the subject of one God would call monotheistic. <clears throat> well, the Jews were not the first monotheistic people in the world. They never have been monotheistic. <clears throat> right. So if you go back into history, you will find the Jews were never monotheistic. They never worship one God. We are given the idea that uh, that there is only one God in all the universe. There's only one God, and that's the Jewish God. He is the one God, and, the, and his one people are the monotheistic people who worship the one God. Until you do some research on the field and go to the encyclopedias and the reference works on the Bible, and then you will see, no, the Jews were a henotheistic, spell H-E-N-O. He no theistic, meaning he no means to pick one from a group. Mm -hmm. So if you have, say, 15 gods standing in front of you and you decide you like to follow this one god, you pick him out, the one you like, like we do in in America with with, uh, our our, uh, elections. We pick out the one fool we like. <clears throat> and we elect him. And so now we've got a, 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 a deep association with the one that we pick. 
and so that's why I said in the book in the uh, in the uh, in the Bible Old Testament when it talks about the Ten Commandments, the first commandment says, "I am the Lord your God, and I shall not have uh, faith uh, other gods before me." It doesn't say, I am the only God in the universe. No, that's the idea that we've been given. We Gentiles have been given that idea that the Jews worship the only true God in the whole universe. No, they were henotheistic, not monotheistic, meaning the Jews picked one God from a group. And this is, uh, this is, this is well known in Israel today that the picking of the one God from a group called henotheistic. <clears throat> and this is why today we have a complete misunderstanding about the God of Israel and the Bible. Mm-hmm. Because the word God in, in, in the Phoenician language was El. El was a name for the God Saturn. Saturn was called El. And another name for Saturn in the ancient world was uh, <clears throat> Shabbat. Shabbat was spelled S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Look it up in the dictionary. S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Shabbat was a name for the planet Saturn in the Middle East. A long time ago, thousands of years ago, the planet Saturn was well understood and knew that it was a planet of the rings. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't realize that, that the ancient peoples of the world knew Saturn had rings. And they gave him the name of Shabbat. And so today, if you're, go- if you're going to worship the planet Saturn, you do it on Saturn's day. You do it at the Temp L or the Temp Isle. And so today we call it, the worship of Shabbat is called the Sabbath. So in the Ten Commandments, remember to keep holy the Sabbath. As if you're keeping holy the Sabbath, you're keeping holy the the day is Saturday. Because Saturday is named after the Jewish god Saturn. And Saturn was called Shabbat. And so we have a celebration in Judaism called the Sabbath. Sabbath is the worship of the planet Saturn. So just remember, when you are keeping holy the Sabbath, you're not being very holy. You're still worshiping an old pagan, ancient Saturnian god, Saturn. Mm. This is why I, I am so convinced that I want to tell the world the way it really is, the real truth about the religions that we have today. We don't realize that we are worshiping the same ancient gods that the ancient pagans had. And we like to criticize them because they were ignorant and ill-informed and ancient peoples. They didn't know anything about nothing. And so we are highly intelligent today. No, in point of fact, it's just the opposite. The ancient peoples knew far more than we will ever be able to understand. The, the builders of the pyramids and the great temples of the world have all understood the universe and the whole concept of the divine presence in the universe we call God. They knew far more about God than you will ever know. They knew far more about sacred geometry, <clears throat> the building of temples than we will ever know. And so nothing is more obvious than the fact that the ancient peoples knew things we don't know. They are, the Hindus have learned and taught us more about space and time and all the high sciences that we don't even begin to understand today. And so we are not the ultimate creation of God on the earth today. We what? are an ignorant and ill-informed backwards people mm. we call human beings. Right. We humans are backwards. We are not very well read. We're not very well educated. And we think we know everything there is to know about the whole universe, where in point of fact, you don't even understand your own religion. Well, I've got two more questions from people that are inquiring that have been listening, and uh, or, or at least I, I know one of them has, but 
Uh, these these will fit perfectly, I think. And we'll go a little bit long here because we we took a little bit of time before we got Jordan on. We'll go a little longer in this hour and a little longer in the next hour, and I'll cut it back down to two when we put it together. Uh, as long as uh, Jordan can hang around, we'll do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. So uh, here's the thing. Let, let's see. Uh, can you please ask Jordan uh, why it seems like every religion has some sort of singing or chanting in it? Christians sing. Uh, Jews do songs. Although I, well, the person, although I don't like the songs, they do songs. Um, there is a, a, a something that sounds like singing that Muslims do, as well as uh, excuse me, yep. Hindus and a few others. Why is singing a common thread in all of the religions that exist today? And was that always the case? Yes, because vibration, audio, audio vibrations are very important to spiritually understanding the universe. Mm-hmm. We have scientists who are telling you about the difference between uh, who built the pyramids and how they were built, and some are saying that vibrations, sounds, sounds are very important, and vibrations and sounds are extremely important to the human brain, how the brain re, uh, relates to spiritual sounds. And we know that the great uh, uh, composers during the Middle Ages, the, the master composers were composing music according to mathemat- mathematics, and that the, it wasn't just a beautiful sound they were producing. No, it was a mathematical understanding of vibrations that the brain relates to that the human mind can relate to certain vibrational frequencies and it puts you into a spiritual state of mind this is why when you go to churches sometimes during some of the big churches in europe you go in and you just feel the the feeling in the church is just so very strange it's like a spiritual presence there no, it's not a spiritual presence. The, what you're feeling in those churches is called geomancy. Geomancy is the study of ley lines. Ley lines are electrical forces, force frequencies on the earth that the ancient peoples knew all about. The Celtic Druids from Europe were experts on where the ley lines are on the earth. They said that there are that there are lines of electrical power going on on the earth today. And if you stand in the front of that line, if you step on that line, you will feel that electrical frequency go through you. And you can feel that there's something godly going on. There's something otherworldly you're feeling. No, it's just a, uh, it's just a different kind of electrical frequency. It's called ley lines. And if you go back and you look at it, that's what you're doing when you're singing in churches. You are humming and, and, and communicating with the spirit world with vibrations and, and uh, frequencies. And we know all of that has been used by religions for thousands of years. Mm. And well, this is why, and this is why, incidentally, the music industry today in Hollywood is able to captivate the minds of young people and captivate in motion pictures. They have something called mood music. When there's going to be some terrible thing happen, there's some kind of a sinister sound or music that tells you something is bad going to happen. If it was a happy scene, you will have the music to accompany a happy scene. So Hollywood makes music to present a particular scene in a movie. And so it's called mood music. It puts you in the right mood to experience what the movie is going to show you. So music has always been used to connect the human brain to the spirit world. That's why music is so profoundly important today when you see how the young people are being misled into and the and rap music it was developed by the people who developed the uh, rap music was developed by what we would call the British East India Company. 
and it, it has to do with the idea of privatizing uh, uh, jails. Prisons are being privatized. Prisons are being opened up and run by private corporations. And so in order for those corporations to make money, they have to have a lot of, uh, they have to have a lot of prisoners. Mm -hmm. And so the only way you're going to get a lot of prisoners is to whip the people up in the country to be prisoners and to be criminals so they can be prisoners. So you, the same people who came up with the idea of privatizing prisons have come up with the idea of the best way to, to run a prison is to have it filled with people. And so if you have it filled with people, you're making money because it's a private institution. It's a private operation. And so they they came up with the idea, the same people came up with the idea for private prisons, came up with the idea of rap music. Mm -hmm. And we know that because we've heard and I've read the articles by the people who gave us rap music. They said the same people realize if you're going to have a privatized prison, you need to have plenty of prisoners. And how you do that? Well, you you make prisoners out of putting it into the spirit of the, of the people to be revolutionaries, radicals, and criminals, and you give them music that promotes that, and that promotes that kind of an, uh, understanding of the world. Rap music is designed to create uh, a, a criminal element so that we'll have criminals to put into prisons. If we got a big prison, a brand new prison, but you don't have any prisoners, you're just losing money. Right. I'd like to run a couple of my thoughts by you real quickly here related to yep. exactly this subject because I am very much attuned to the uh, study of acoustics and sound and the resulting effects of them uh, personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, because I was a musician and, uh, I, I still to this day appreciate the science behind it. Um, so let us understand a couple of things. First, when you were talking about churches and the experience of being in a church, another thing that comes into play here is the architecture. And why? Because, uh, the, the effects, uh, of just You're the right. breeze blowing, People yep. being inside, the echoing, if you ever notice when you step on a hard floor in a church and you hear that kind of echo that's sort of unique to a church, it is because the architectural design is literally right. constructed to have that effect. And that is a cumulative effect, creating that same atmosphere. It's not just the ley lines, mind you, but it is the utilization of the ley lines that give you the energy, the effect, and the ability to really suspend and excite uh, various parts of the human brain. And believe it or not, the construction of the place, the materials in it, as well as the selection of the tones used, whether it is in the music or it is in the bells in the church towers, are yep. all relative to this, right? That's so exactly right. That's, that's what one I'm thing. talking about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you, you didn't mention the architecture. That's why I was throwing it in. But I, I know you know this. It's just, yep. I figured I'd, I'll throw some of my thoughts in, uh, here as we go. The other thing is, when you're talking about constructing, uh, a, a music and the fact that, uh, some people created blueprints to manipulate the population, it was not only done, uh, to, to, uh, to fuel the prison industrial complex, but various other effects that seem to have been organic things in society were also seemingly directed in exactly the same way. And this has to do, again, with the effects of tone. See, a lot of people think about music and they say, oh, yeah, the lyrics in a particular song created or gave ideas to people. And that can be true on some level. You don't necessarily get manipulated by just, you know, hearing somebody's words. You you can have an effect given to you if you're listening carefully or your mind is in the right state to receive them. Now, how do you get the mind in the right state to receive those lyrics? Well, with certain tonal cues, uh, the mind can become more receptive to the idea, can become, uh, uh, cr create almost like faux emotional reactions as well. And this is not necessarily something that's always done for a negative purpose. I mean, obviously, there are artists who are still creating who are not being manipulated by others, although they may be um, using the templates that are presented to them by others <laughs> in some mm -hmm. cases and inadvertently 
creating things that they don't necessarily realize what they're doing. There's organic artistry, but then again, there's also very well-directed, purposeful use of these things as well. And uh, uh, some people, again, if they're independent, they might be using it to create a mood, to get a sentiment out, to tell a story, whatever it may be. But uh, but when you uh, have have a group of individuals who are, are also familiar with this science and uh, wish to create trends, wish to create directions in a society or in a subculture, this is also a way to do it. And it's all of these things. It's not just the lyrics. It's not just the tones. It's not just the undertones, the many things that a lot of people don't even hear when they're listening to music directly or consciously. But a lot of subconscious messages can be sent by a continuous tone underneath the music that, again, is is not even really truly audible uh, during the time you're listening to it or you're hearing it in the background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, all, all of these things, I mean, do you disagree with anything I'm offering as no, my thoughts? No, 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 that's exactly right. And I would add to that that there was a book put out many years ago uh, that was a phenomenally important book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television mm. by Jerry Mander, M-A-N-D-E-R. Okay. Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And in this book, the, the man who wrote it was the head of an advertising agency in San Francisco that, that advertised the biggest corporations in the world. He was in charge of uh, promoting Ford Motor Company, General Electric, General Motors, etc. And his company was very, very large. And he said in his book that he quit. He walked off and, and wa walked away from the industry because he wanted to tell the people what was really going on with television. And he explained how television actually works and who founded it, who did the experimenting on television and, and brought it into our world and how it works and what it does and uh, electrically what it does with us. And he was saying that the Germans, the Nazis, were very big on working up, trying to come together, bring their t their knowledge together to create what they called television. Mm -hmm. The Nazis were. It was a Nazi operation to try and figure out how to uh, give pictures to the human population on the earth, how you could uh, propagandize them with movies and television and pictures and sounds. And so it has a Nazi connection, uh, you know, television does. But the other point he, he brought out, I think it was very germane to what we're talking about, is that television is firing the, uh, the, the, the picture tube is firing, uh, uh, a rays, uh, electronic signals and the, and there's the electronic signals that fire the pictures onto the screen is also has another electronic signal connected to it it's called it's called it's uh, uh, the term he used uh, i seem to recall it was like a writing uh, this other signal was writing on the main signal to send you the pictures the carrier wave there's another yeah and so that other signal that you don't see is designed, it was based on something called Earth Resonant Frequency. Mm -hmm. Earth Resonant Frequency was a frequency of, of uh, vibrations and sound that uh, puts you to sleep. That's why he says it's the same frequency if you sit under a big tree and, and, and a metal where the, everything is very quiet, very peaceful. You're sitting on the ground and you're laying up against the tree and you fall asleep. It's called earth frequency. There's a frequency that the earth is giving off that you are feeling as a human and it puts you to sleep. And so he says, so the same frequency and he gave the, he gave the number of it and explained it. And he said that that's what's when you sit down to watch TV, it is designed, television is designed to, to hit your brain with an earth resonant frequency as it is giving you audio and video pictures. And what it's doing is putting your brain to sleep 
so that you will not give it, you will not have any problem accepting whatever it is you're seeing as putting your brain to sleep with something called earth resonant frequency. And, and the mind goes to sleep, even though you're sitting there with your eyes open, your brain is sleeping. And you don't even realize it. Now they're telling you stuff on the television, you know, the television show, which is propaganda, is putting you to sleep and telling you what you to, what you should think and how to think and how to how to view things. So it's a it's a propaganda machine. But he mm-hmm. said, uh, the point I really liked is he said something to the effect that. Television is propaganda, but propaganda does not deceive you. Propaganda helps you to deceive yourself. You're buying into it when you sit there in front of a television and watch it, so-called news programs. The the network news uh, is actually a propaganda machine to put you to sleep so you will believe whatever it tells you. Right. Well, you know, Jordan, before we go to it, I want to take a short break, a very, very short break. But before we do that, you know, it's not just the news that you're you're placed into this uh, susceptible kind of uh, brainwave state. Um, I have another guest who talks about how that that state that they use, you know, the uh, the frequency that that they use for everything from your electricity to your television, to your electronics, to everything is actually a little bit off from where it could be, they could make it a lot more natural and yep. not agitate everybody, but they don't, and it has something to do with changes that were made post-World War II based on the German design, which uh, make things just a little less healthy, a little less uh, comfortable and everything else, and this is why you see that uh, we, we have had a greater time of agitation post-World War II, uh, and he's, you know, a, a master electrician, right, explaining right. this. And he talks about it all the time. And it's really, it, it gets me a little confused, but it is precisely what you're discussing here. And and one might say, well, look, of course we know news is propaganda. Well, here's another quick thought. Um, I've watched television. Of course, you have, Jordan. Uh, almost anybody who's listening to this, I guarantee you, has at one time watched television. Of course. Um, you ever notice that... Uh, yeah, you might get hungry for the cheeseburger they show you on TV. Of course, and I know why. <laughs> well, th- th- this is the same thing. Be- it's not really that you were hungry. It's not really. No, no. But, you know, and, and see, here's the thing. It's not just propaganda in the words and the pictures, but it's also the design of what's happening to your brainwaves. So literally, you have now convinced yourself that you want that cheeseburger, yep. <laughs> you know, or, or sub or pizza or whatever it is. I, I, I find this every time. Even looking at these commercials on, uh, on other things like, you know, YouTube and stuff because I get stuck with commercials all the time. Um, you know, it, it, you look at it and you go, you know, I, I actually would like to eat <laughs> whatever course, they have in front know, of you. <laughs> I remember an interview <clears throat> done with a man who owned a drive in theater in Los Angeles and he was being interviewed about the concept of drive-in theaters and where it started and mm-hmm. how it began and, and how how uh, important is it, how lucrative is it, the whole business of drive-in theaters. And he said, well, we actually put into the films, we have uh, one frame every so often uh, showing you a picture of a hamburger and fries and, and cold drinks and 7-Up or whatever, and it's a frame that's actually in the end of the movie, and we and, and it's just one frame, but it's quite a few of them. But there's there's space every every ten or fifteen frames. There will be a picture of the hamburger and French fries, and it says we're hungry. And he says so we put that into the film so people watching the film do not realize they just have one frame that they didn't even see. It was just so quick. But the brain picked it up. The mind picked it up. Mm -hmm. And you didn't realize that your brain saw it, and it is now talking to you. You're getting hungry. You need to go and get something to eat. And he said that's because it's in the. we actually put that picture in the film. And it was only one or two times we did it, but but it's enough for the people, when the movie is over, wanting to come in and buy food. That's what we want. That's what we want them to do is come in and buy 
That's how we're making our money. Right. And we, we, prov- we provide them with the idea in the movie. They didn't even see it. So, like I said, uh, you know, propaganda doesn't deceive you. It helps you to deceive yourself. Oh, right. And, and look, this cuts all different ways. But, but like I said, it could be about selling you an idea. It could be about selling you a cheeseburger. But one way or another, uh, very much it's about convincing you that, uh, something is good and you're ready for it. And doesn't that frighten you just a little bit when they're doing war reporting? After all, uh, I, I find that people that watch more news about a war or about a terrible situation seem to accept it more. They really do. And, uh, of course, this sounds almost like we're not talking about religion. But once again, when you create an environment, like whether it's a drive-in movie theater, which those things have gone away because sophistication is well beyond splicing in a frame of a picture of food anymore. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways this is done. Some of them, some of it is done with harmonics. There is a reason why there is a music bed. There is a reason why there is a sound bed to these things. Uh, That's right. which is not, again, necessarily audible, just like that frame is not something that you're going to recall. Well, I saw a picture of a cheeseburger and fries. Nope. You, you might not recall that, but your, your mind, your subconscious mind picks right. that stuff the up subconscious very well. saw it, right. <clears throat> so, I know that's true because I've had it happen to me. <laughs> right, exactly. But meanwhile, there, there's a lot more to the religion discussion, uh, and I got one more question left. Of course, if you guys so want to add in more, or a Monday discussion so continues with the great Jordan Maxwell, which again, his website is jordanmaxwellshow.com. This is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Once again, you can join the research society there for a one-time fee. Go much deeper into the subjects we've discussed tonight and many, many others, including the monetary system, government itself, the idea of identity politics obviously is in there a bit, but more historically than current events, it seems like, because, you know, really people don't understand the history to begin with. And hey, seems like that matches the same description when you go under the religious uh, tab in the research society. You got to see it for yourself. A lot of images, resources, and links to resources there that you will not see anywhere else in the research society. Also, a couple of videos over there you can get directly from the source, Jordan Maxwell himself, because, again, this is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. It is jordanmaxwellshow.com, and you could download and watch those videos on demand, I think, for a very small fee over there. I know you've only got a couple up, but there are more to come, and... um There's going to be more to the site anyway as it goes. There's also a public section. Obviously, look at it. You can email Jordan directly, ask him a question, send him feedback about this show or any other. You can uh, make a donation over there because this is uh, one of the ways that Jordan is allowed to survive is based on your donations. Uh, and uh, uh, he has little else to work with. So, obviously, those are always appreciated over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. There is a PayPal button. And, uh, like I said, email him, donate to him, interact with him, join the Research Society. It is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's, jordanmaxwellshow.com. So we were taking some questions here. Now, I've only got one more loaded up. If anybody wants to enter them in, obviously, again, info at Ocelli.com, Twitter over, uh, you know, at Ocelli.com, on Skype, Charles.Ocelli. I will gladly take the questions and enter them in as soon as I get them and have a chance to. Now, if you're hearing this on a replay, no worries. You can send me the questions, and I'll save them for the next time I sit down with Jordan, as I have done tonight for the most part. Um, there is one live question coming in, but I have, I have one still backed up. So we'll, let's clear out the first one. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jordan, as we continue the discussion here, here's this question. And this is, uh, from somebody who says his name is Bob. I'm not sure that that's his name. I, I actually think cause he, he sent it in an email and didn't give an email return address or anything like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with the name Bob for now. Um, Jordan, is there an actual location for the garden of Eden as it's described in the old Testament? 
Many people make, uh, well, you know, many people do presentations about that. So is there a, a an actual location for the fabled Garden of Eden in the Old Testament, Jordan? Uh, I think perhaps there is. I think perhaps there is, but I do believe that that was probably the story of the great flood in the Old Testament, the great flood of Noah's day. I believe that story is actually telling us an older story of the of the story of Atlantis. I believe the Bible is talking about Atlantis when it tells us the story of Noah and the ark and the great flood of of Noah's day because it says actually in the Bible that the great floodgates of the deep opened up and the land fell into the ocean. The, uh, the floodgates of the of the ocean opened up because we know that rain, scientifically, uh, if it rained 40 days and 40 nights, would not be enough rain to cover the highest mountain. That's not going to possibly happen. You're not going to have that much water on the earth to cover the highest mountain, so it was not a worldwide flood. It was not something that covered the highest mountain on the earth. No. The mountains were caused by some kind of a catastrophe, yes. But it was not the Great Flood. The Great Flood was local. It was a local flood. And the idea, going back to that when the flood happened, it says the Bible says that it not only rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but that the Great Flood, uh, the Great Waters of the deep opened up. It, the idea being that there was some kind of an earthquake where the waters of the deep opened up and the land fell into the opening. Well, that's what we're told happened to Atlantis, that there was a great catastrophe, flood or something, where Atlantis sunk overnight, instantly sunk overnight into the ocean and was gone forever. I believe that that what we're talking about in the book of Genesis is about Atlantis. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Now, if there was a place where Adam and Eve were being created in a garden of paradise, I think there probably was. And most likely that was some kind of a place that was on Atlantis or maybe in, uh, in the Mediterranean somewhere where the extraterrestrials who came here and messed with our DNA and recreated us, they obviously had to take whoever these these creatures were that they were going to operate on and crossbreed with them. They had to put that female into a protective area where the other animals couldn't uh, harm her. And, and because she was going to be given birth to an extraterrestrial birth, and so that's why she was put into some kind of a protective environment, which is exactly what we would do today. If you're going to take one particular animal and you're going to crossbreed with that animal, you would take it out of the herd, out of the group, and put it someplace where it's going to be safe while you work on it, while you work your experiment on it. I think that's exactly what happened with the story of Adam and Eve, that Somebody came here from out there, off-world entities came here and saw the indigenous creatures and said, hmm, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Mm -hmm. And so the scripture is saying that somebody came here from out there. Well, what's out there? Well, God's out there. Well, maybe God came here and said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let's make him look like us. And so then later on, the scripture says, God says, here man has become as one of us. He's like us. He looks like us. And he's just like us. And so I think that there was a place in particular Somewhere on the earth, probably in the Atlantic somewhere, on, on Atlantis, uh, or that's where it would have to be, would be on Atlantis, or in somewhere in the Mediterranean, 
where the uh, where that paradise uh, or that Garden of Eden was mm. actually a real place where uh, the real creatures were being dealt with by extraterrestrials because we now are seeing all kinds of signs that there were extraterrestrials here who came from other planets, who came from other worlds out there in space. And you ask any child if you believe in God, yes, where is God? And he will point out there. So God's out there. Well, what do you mean out there? What is the out there? Well, it's heaven. Well, God's in heaven. That's right. He's out there in the heavens. And uh, and he came here, and he saw the indigenous creatures that were here, the, the Neanderthal creatures who had evolved here, and said, hmm, come, let us, who's us, more than one, mm-hmm. let us make man in our image, after our like." This is what a rabbi told me many years ago, a very high-ranking rabbi. He's still alive today. He told me that uh, it does, the Bible does not say God created man. The Bible says God recreated man. It says in Genesis one twenty-eight that God said, Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Uh, and then after man was made, it was the the, comba- the commandment was, go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And I said to the rabbi, is that a correct translation when it says replenish the earth? Yes, that's exactly what it meant. Well, re, R-E, means do it again. He said, that's exactly right. Mm. Because uh, there was a great flood in Genesis 6, I think it is, Genesis 6, 1, where after the great flood of Noah's day, when the, when the, uh, when the ark, we're told, when the ark came to sit on dry land, that uh, God said to Noah and his sons and wives, go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, of course, and I, the rabbi said, of course, if God has destroyed all life with the great flood, and he wants humans on the earth, he's created the earth for us, right. well, then we're going to have to re r e do again, replenish the earth. Not plenish, replenish. <clears throat> and that's why it says in Genesis 1, when God created Adam and Eve, and the, and the, uh, the, the word was, go forth and replenish the earth again. So therefore, Adam and Eve were not the first humans. They were not the first intelligent creatures on the earth. They were a remaking of man. Go forth and remake man again. Right. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So it's a remaking of the human family. And so we have now things called, there's a whole study in science of pre-idemic man. Pre-Adamic means before Adam even was created, there was already man on the earth. So you can say God did not create man. God merely recreated man. He came here and said, do it again. And so let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So now we look like the gods who came here and created us. And that's why... Day. That's why when I hear people saying that they've had, uh, you know, one-on-one confrontations with extraterrestrials who look like humans, well, that's what makes sense to me because that's what the Bible says. God well, said, "Come, mm-hmm. let us make man in our image after our likeness, not make man. No, man's already here. Let's remake him to look like us and be like us." And well, then the scripture says later that man, here, man has become as one of us. He looks like us. Right. Also note, this is us, this is we, this is not one. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, we, we're in God's image as in one God. We are in the God's image. Well, seems as though there was a plural attached to that. Anyway. Uh, a live, a live Twitter question, <laughs> which, uh, I think this is the first time I've taken a question directly from Twitter, uh, for you, Jordan, because I, I put it out there. So we got one, didn't we? Um, 
And the question reads exactly as follows. This is from uh, the Twitter handle is one minute to midnight, uh, which is uh, somebody that I know listens to the show all the time. Anyway, uh, can he speak at all to the idea that the Flavians actually created Christianity in order to quell the Messianic Jews? Question mark. That's the whole question, exactly as it was tweeted to me, Jordan. Uh, that the that the Pleiadians created Christianity. The Flavians. He spelled it F L A V I A N S. Oh yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No um, problem. Yes, I think that's yes. There is something to that. I think that there is enough uh, evidence to show that the the Flavians did create Christianity. The Romans created it. There was a Roman family called the, it was a, in line for the Caesar of Rome, were called the Flavians. And they, they created Christianity. Yes, I, that story is on the web. You could go and watch it. It's a, there was quite a bit of, of uh, videos on that subject. And I think there is something to it because it makes sense that the Romans would come up with the idea of Christianity. Uh, right, and you see references. That's where it came from. You know, that's why today uh, the Vatican says they are the original Christianity. Mm-hmm. Well, you're talking about Rome. Well, and, and here you go for somebody who maybe doesn't necessarily recognize the uh, the the word Flavians. Uh, you know, it well, was a family name. Yeah, it was the name of a family. Julius Flavor, Flavius Caesar. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's the house, uh, and, and the, there you have the Julian order and the house of, uh, Julius, which Julius Flavius. That's part of Julius Caesar's name. Just yep, so people right. understand that. Okay. Yep. Uh, but, but please continue. I just want to throw that in in case somebody was thrown by that. I know you, you're not, Jordan. I mean, <laughs> you've forgotten more than most people know about these things. I'm just saying that, uh, that I just felt that that was a good thing to put in there as well. Um, but it, it does seem rather interesting that, uh, it would be a political and also a spiritual solution. Oh. You know what? Here comes something else. This one is on email, though. <laughs> um, you have not discussed witchcraft in uh, in regards to the spoken word aloud and song. Ooh, okay. And I would like to know, does Jordan know anything about the use of sound when it comes to magical practices? In various religious orders, including Christianity. I think that's what we've talked about already. I, I, yes, I thought so too, that. but anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I, I think we talked about that and we established, yes, there is a very definite connection between uh, humans with your human brain being able to co-mingle with the spirit world you, you're opening yourself up to the spirit world uh, by sounds and this is why uh, there's always been chanting the chantings are being done mm-hmm. by all the ancient religions in the world because chanting the bible calls satan that says satan when he was created uh, he was he was given pipes he was the god of pipes and sounds I think that's interesting. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says Satan, when he came into the picture, he was the god of pipes and sounds and music. He was a musical god. Mm. And this is why the word muse, muse was were a term that was given to the angels in the book of uh, Hesiod, the Theogony of Hesiod. Hesiod was an ancient Greek who said he had one-on-one communications and conversations with spirit angels from another world. They came here and talked with him, and he said they they told him they called themselves muses, which Mm -hmm. gives us our word music, amusement, museum, amusement. Uh, Muses were spirit entities, and this is why we have something called music. Mm-hmm. Because these spirits are communicating with us in, in, our, in our brains with frequencies, with radio frequencies, with musical frequencies. And, uh, and so, yes, there is a definite connection between the use of, uh, of, of sounds 
and chants, etc., in in our religious services because we mm-hmm. are actually communicating with the spirit world when you're hearing these chants, Gregorian well, chants, etc. Yeah. And th- this goes across cultures and across religions. I mean, uh, most of the things that you just attributed to Satan, in fact, are, are, are things that could be easily attributed to the pre-Christian god Apollo. Uh, of course. You know, uh, yep. again, the, the lord of the muses, if you will. And, uh, uh, various things like that. Got another Twitter question. <laughs> uh, Joseph Green asks, uh, okay, let's see. How, oh, excuse me. How does Jordan feel about Charles Fort? Is the oh, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about him, I think, on your show. You, you sure Charles have. <laughs> Fort, the book, the book Charles Fort wrote was given to me when I was 19 years old as a gift from a man that I am sure was not fully human. And he suggested that I should read a book, and he gave me a copy. It was called The Complete Works of Charles Fort. And I think that the book of Charles Fort is probably the most phenomenally fascinating book you'll ever you'll ever pick up. You can still get it today in bookstores. You can order it easy. You can go on my website. You can go on my website, jordanmaxwellshow.com, and and on there you will see a, 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 a folder, a, a little flyer that says recommended materials. Those are the books I highly recommend. And Charles Fort is on there. Look for the complete works of Charles Fort on recommended materials and just click on it. It'll take you right to Amazon to order it. It's called The Complete Works of Charles Fort, and what that book does, it'll blow your mind. It tells you what Charles Fort did was he took, uh, he went to libraries, and he was able to, he had some sort of a, of a retirement, or, or some, some sort of money from his family, so he didn't have to work. So he spent many years going through the library, in New York and going through all the big libraries, looking up all the strangest experiences that have ever happened on the earth that that science has no explanation for whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And he outlines in footnotes in every paragraph, he talks about some strange incident that happened in the world that nobody has any idea to explain it at all, and then he tells you where it was written, who wrote the article, where you can find it if you want to do your own research. It's a gold mine of occultism. It's a gold mine of hidden knowledge right. about strange things which have happened on the earth that nobody can explain. And I was fascinated with the book back when I was 19 years old, when it was given to me by my girlfriend's father. It was a it was an strange experience when I met my girlfriend's father. He was not of this world. There's no doubt in my mind of that. And he suggested that I read this book, which I did, and it changed my life overnight because it's such a fascinating book. I love it. I still have a copy right here with me on my bookcase. There you go. So one other question has come in. Uh, I did this one uh, through the Skype, and so I have to roll it and be able to read it correctly here. So bear with me a second, Jordan. Um, okay. the uh, All right, I'll shorten this a little bit. The idea that the, uh, the Bible is uh, divinely inspired and therefore it is the Word of God is, uh, is commonplace. Uh, so... This person is asking, is not everything according to that sort of idea that is written by a man, therefore not also divinely inspired? Or could it be argued that many things are divinely inspired? And since there are more than one, uh, since there are more than one sources for inspiration, <laughs> Among the gods, does that not mean that uh, various works of literature might have been inspired by different gods? Is this a subject that Jordan has an opinion on? Yes, I certainly do. That's exactly what I think. 
is that when we talk about the gods, there is a spirit world. There is a spirit world that is is leading us and guiding us. And as a matter of fact, I have a I have a quote right here in front of me. This is a quote from the Quran. Where is it? Hold on just a minute. Oh, no it's worries. Uh, I, I find this question fascinating myself because uh, th- this is one of the arguments I make all the time regarding, uh, uh, you know, a- anything, in, in fact, to my mind, could easily be, you know, divinely inspired, and I'm holding up air quotes, because there is a, a spiritual significance to creativity in general. So, therefore, it seems to me like uh, a work of art such as a painting or a sculpture or a piece of music could be also something that is uh, influenced by yes. the spirit world. And, in fact, I think uh, the majority of it truly is, uh, especially, you know, things that are that are complex that seem to be, you know, you, you meet an artist who has created something that is just full of all these textures and interesting things, whether it's, again, music or writing or doesn't matter. And, and it's wild because you look at the person and you think to yourself, I don't even know how this came from this person. Um, I think it's easily explained that sometimes there's more of an influence from the spirit world than uh, than in other occasions, right? Um, there's no doubt about so that. So that's the way exactly I see it. Right. But you had a quote from the Quran you were going to uh, give us here. Yeah, the, the quote from the Quran, and I'm looking for it right now. I thought I had it on my on my desktop. Well, no worries. Uh, you know, it, it's it's it, all right if you want to paraphrase. Here it, it. is. Here yeah. it is. This is from Quran. 15-9 Quran 15-9 says quote the gods are speaking and it says we indeed it was we who sent down the Quran to you and indeed we will be its guardians end quote Quran 15-9 says indeed it was we who sent down the Quran to you, and indeed we will be its guardians. End quote. So there is a classic example of the gods giving to mankind their scriptures. So when we think, oh, well, the, the, uh, the holy ones of Israel, they wrote these holy scriptures. No, even the Quran. It says that in the Bible. It says that in many of the, all the other ancient Le, uh, text, uh, text of the world the idea is that the spirit gods have given us our holy books mm-hmm. we have given you we have sent down to you the Quran and indeed we will be its guardians that's what it says in the Quran so what it's actually saying is somebody is telling the Islamic people but they're not listening we have given you a book called the Quran, mm. and indeed we will be its guardian. And you will read this book and you will believe it because we know how to manipulate you. We know how to have power over your mind. So we gave you the book, the Quran, and you just sit and read it, and we will put the spirit into you to believe the Quran. Now, now we, somebody might say... Now, somebody might say that it's almost foolish to assume that, uh, you know, a book fell from the sky or that, uh, you know, uh, Moses, which we've covered on this show quite a bit and talked about, you know, in this series uh, about the, the stone tablets that allegedly had these laws that were written by God upon them. Right. Yeah. Um, this is symbolism. It, it's all symbolism. Right. All of it is. And here's the point of it. What you do, because anybody would say, look, you can only prove that these things were written by man. Fine. I concede that point. But here's the problem. <laughs> if you concede that someone can be divinely inspired, someone can be demonically inspired, someone can be inspired by an ethereal being of any type to commit certain actions, whether they be positive or negative, whether they be to save lives or to take them or whether they be to do harm or to heal, one way or another, then one must also concede that that, that the writing of these things is also directly inspired, not just the holy books, but 
a lot of things could easily... Well, of course they be, are. Of course. Yeah. Anything man's writing is being inspired to write. Right. And so if you held up, if you take a book, the Quran, into the Islamic world, and you say to the, to the people there, you say to the Mohammedans there, how did you come by this book? Who wrote this book? Oh, well, we know the authors who wrote the book. Well, who, where did it come from? Where did the knowledge come from? Well, the book itself says, we who have sent down the Quran to you, mm -hmm. and indeed we will be its guardians. It was we who sent it down to you, meaning that the whole book when it was being written was not coming from a man. It was coming from those who called themselves we. We sent it down to you. We're the ones that that inspired you with this with this book. We're the ones that put it into the the writer's mind to write this, these stories down that we put into your mind. So it was we who sent down the Quran to you, mm -hmm. and we will be as guardians. We will protect it. We who's we the gods Elohim the gods right. more than one. And so that's the same thing as in the Bible. The Bible, and the scripture says in Genesis 1, uh, in the beginning, the gods, G-O-D-S, more than one. In the beginning, the gods made the heavens and the earth. Not God, gods, more than one. Mm. And so you go back to Genesis 1, 28, when gods are creating Adam and Eve. <clears throat> and it says, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So what Genesis 1 is saying is that we today have been remade. Somebody has remade us and, and messed with our DNA and our genetics. And uh, I'm thinking that if we were Neanderthal creatures, we were these cavemen kind of creatures, thousands of years ago and somebody came down here and saw us and said let us make these these creatures we look like cavemen roaming around uh, and and why don't we make them look like us and make them intelligent and put my and put a, a, a part of us in them and overnight we come out and we're writing beautiful music and designing lasers and television and computers and beautiful poetry and music and all kinds of spiritually enlightening stuff coming from the human family. Yes, there's a half of that. And then the other half is the, is the animal instinct in man. So we have the animal and the spiritual. Well, the spiritual came from they who came down and saw, and saw us and said, let us put ourselves in them. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so what they did is they created a new kind of man. And the, the scripture actually says in Hebrew, uh, the term was A-D-M, not A-D-A-M, not Adam, A-D-M, which simply means a different kind of creature. So we're going to make a different kind of creature out of the Peking or the Cro-Magnon man or the Neanderthal creatures, whoever these ancient, uh, what we call hominids in science, the hominid creatures, whatever they were, somebody came down here and crossbred with the females and recreated a new kind of creature. That's us. We today are a are offspring of the gods that recreated us. And that's why I particularly feel that there's some kind of a connection between those ancient hominid creatures and the first time that, that the uh, extraterrestrials tried to recreate us in their image and likeness. They, it was an experiment. And as with any experiment, you're not, you're not going to make it right the first time. So you have to experiment more than once. Maybe the first time the creature that they created when they crossbred these extraterrestrials with the hominid creatures, with the Neanderthals, maybe their offspring were what we would call today Bigfoot, the Yetis, 
the uh, the Bigfoot that we know that live in the forest of the world. They live all over the earth. We hear about Bigfoot everywhere. And he's called the abominable snowman. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of names for him. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, well, they look like the uh, ancient Neanderthal creatures. They look like the ancient hominid creatures that we have skeletons for. But they seem to be far smarter than we are and far more fierce and, and frightening to us, these, uh, you know, these Bigfoot. And I think maybe Bigfoot is the first rendition of uh, what, what was given to us by these extraterrestrials when they put too much of themselves into that creature and not enough of something else, and so they had to redo it again, and ultimately they kept redoing it until they came up with us today, modern-day man. Mm. You know, and it's even possible, uh, some people look at the concept of evolution and uh, state that, you know, this is not uh, sensible and things like that, but but let's let's reverse-engineer that for a moment. Let's imagine that for uh, the, po- the, the argument's sake, that uh, this engineering that you're talking about could have even produced some of, you know, they say apes and humans are related. The DNA is a little bit similar. Okay. Um, well, you know, why why wouldn't they be an experiment that just wasn't satisfactory? It didn't need to be destroyed, let's say, but it just wasn't quite all what they wanted it to be. That's and right. so we'll let them be because they're generally vegetarians and seem to have an order about them and they do have interactions and they are able to communicate and they're all right, but they're not exactly what we were shooting for. That's um, exactly right. So there's a possibility that they are our ancestors in a very direct way uh, if you right. look at it from this perspective. Right, Jordan? That's exactly what the scripture says in Genesis 1, the first chapter. The gods came here, and this is why God in Hebrew is El, E-L, but it doesn't say that in the, in the Jewish scriptures. If you go to Genesis 1-1 in the Hebrew Bible, in the Jewish Bible, it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, not El, not E-L. El is God. It says Elohim. Elohim is a plural. Right. So it's like writing the word G O D comma S. It's a as God is is G uh, God is E L and more than one God in the plural is L Lohim. It's like adding an S onto the word car. Car is one or cars mm-hmm. means more than one. And so in the Bible, in Genesis one one it actually says in the Old language in the old Hebrew, what we call Hebrew language, it says in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is a plural, meaning more than one. That's why we read in Genesis one twenty eight when God is creating the first man and woman, it says, And God said, Come let us U S meaning more than one. Mm-hmm. Come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not mm-hmm. make man, he's already here. Let's make him look like us. Let's make him so he looks just like us. It will be like us. He will be in our image and our likeness. Right. Now, we've gone a couple of minutes over here, but that is for the sake of editing. <laughs> but if you're listening live, you're uh, definitely thinking to yourself, they're going a little long tonight. Um, but we're not going to go too long. We don't want to certainly uh, wear Jordan out in any way, shape, or form or wear your humble host out. I've got a long week ahead of me, so uh, I am going to bring this to a close. But you can continue to send in your questions, and I will certainly bring them right to Jordan's attention the next time we get together. Yep, and that was good. I know you're always happy to uh, to go through an entire show, which we just did pretty much with questions. Yep, um, yep. But you can continue on also investigating these things by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. It is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Remember that. But also there is the research society there, which you can you know, you have to join, and there's a, you know there's a one time fee for joining it, but well worth it to go much deeper into all of the subjects we've covered tonight. 
plus a lot more, including the monetary system, the way government really works, the, uh, you know, the, the, your, your birth certificate. I mean, a whole lot of information there about, uh, society in general, suggested reading. In some cases, uh, articles you won't find elsewhere, links to things that you probably wouldn't find all by yourself necessarily, but all of that and a way to be able to email Jordan Maxwell himself because, again, it's the only website that's his. You can email Jordan directly there or make a donation straight to Jordan's well-being at jordanmaxwellshow.com. Jordan, I want to thank you for continuing on with this series. This show went a little different than uh, <laughs> some of the others, but I think we well, got to okay. a lot of great information, and uh, I really appreciate your patience with me constantly cutting in to uh, to bring to your attention the questions that are being sent in from the audience because uh, – well, this I love it. That's important. what I do. I'm always happy to be able to be on a show and answer questions the best I can. And like I have said so many times, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I'm just an ordinary man who's by chance happened to, by chance to have been in a company of extraordinarily brilliant people that I all my friends are have been uh, interesting and fascinating people in positions to know dark secrets and I have learned much from my friends <clears throat> and so that's why I try and pass that on to my audience the things which I have been privileged to know about and hear about and read about and learn about it's a fascinating world and as I've told you before nothing in this world is what you think it is you need to go down deeper into every subject and you will find that there's a world of knowledge you have never been told before. <clears throat> That's what I try to do. Absolutely true. Jordan Maxwell, once again, we appreciate you. We've had the privilege of having a very long series with you. 